Hey guys, and welcome to episode 223 of the OCDStories.com podcast. Now in this episode, I chat with Stacey Wachner. Stacey is Director of OCD Specialists, a private psychotherapy practice, and I got her on to talk specifically about real event OCD. So in this episode, we break down what this theme is, uh, what makes this theme OCD, how someone can know if this is OCD or a reasonable response to a real event, cognitive distortions of black and white thinking around right and wrong, some of the obsessions and compulsions one may find with this theme, uh, what ERP and CBT looks like for this theme, mindfulness, self-compassion, and much, much more. Uh, I'm glad I finally got to cover this topic, and if this has affected you, I hope this episode helps you. And without further ado, here is Stacy. On the podcast today, I have Stacy Walkner. Stacy is director of OCD Specialists, a private psychotherapy practice treating adolescents and adults with OCD and related disorders. Welcome to the podcast, Stacy. Hi, thanks for having me. It's good to have you here. And um, as I mentioned earlier, it'd be good to get your therapy story. So, kind of what got you into treating uh, people generally, but specifically OCD. Well, when I was in graduate school, I had an internship and um, I worked at a hospital where they kind of lumped everybody together, Mm -hmm. no matter what diagnosis you had in a therapy group. And um, it was for a partial hospitalization program. And they were treating people with OCD in the same room as people with bipolar and major depression. And and I thought, oh, my gosh, this poor guy (laughs) was really suffering and he needed help. Well, at the same time, I was in a cognitive behavioral therapy course and was learning about exposure and response prevention. And I guess I was one of the lucky ones who actually got trained with ERP in graduate school. And I started kind of helping him individually on the side with ERP and really could not was became very excited about how effective it was and how much it was changing his life and getting him back to the life he wanted. So I really fell in love with the treatment. Um, And then when I came back to Los Angeles, I just kind of sought out becoming an OCD therapist and specializing in OCD because it was something that, you know, was very rewarding seeing people get their lives back. Yeah. No, absolutely. And, um, yeah. Okay. No, thank you for that. I'm always fascinated to hear, you know, why the people I'm interviewing became to, or came to do what they do. Uh, so, uh, I definitely. Read, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I like that story and, uh, I got you on the show today cause I read a really good article you did, which I will link in the show notes. So anyone that wants to read it, uh, and it was about real event OCD, uh, which is a part of OCD or a sub theme or, or, topic or whatever you want to call it um that i experienced in my own life or in my own kind of ocd life uh and it's something i was always fascinated by and little was read about it and it's not really something that's even been talked about on my show so i know i had to get you on to kind of unpack this for i'm sure for the many listening who who uh, have experienced this theme uh so i guess my first question is what is real event ocd Well, I, um, you know, that article, actually, (laughs) I have gotten so much feedback on. I've gotten so many people from across the world and across the U.S. just contacting me, and they're suffering so much with these incessant, intrusive, and just um, maddening thoughts about an event that happened in their past and really not believing or knowing that it's OCD because it was actually about a real event that really happened to them instead of just some sort of imaginary thought about, um, you know, Mm -hmm. something that, you know, being a, being a pedophile, being gay when you're not, or, you know, being contaminated. It really was like about something that they did or something that happened to them in the past. And, um, but they, for some reason they were contacting me. So they had some inkling (laughs) of that there was something that was excessive about the amount that their brain was stuck. And, um, and so real event OCD is, is about 
somebody, it's about having obsessions and compulsions about, um, uh, you know, an event that really happened to you, something that you did, something that you usually something that you don't feel proud of or that you're ashamed of Mm -hmm. and that your brain is somehow stuck on it. Now, these events aren't something that people, everybody, even people that do not have OCD, do not have happen to them um, or that they don't also do in their lives. It's just that they're able to kind of like not feel good about those events, but move on from Mm -hmm. them. Whereas when you have OCD, your brain is more sticky and that event will kind of like repeat in your head and you won't be able to move on from it. And then that then results in performing compulsions and an effort to try to get that, those memories of that event out of your head. And in turn, it ends up uh, reinforcing it and making it a lot more powerful. So, um, yeah. Yeah. No, thank you. And uh, I guess my other question of that is, so with the events, can it be events that for someone who doesn't have OCD, they would never second guess those events, if that makes sense. Like they may not be proud of it, but they may not be ashamed of it in equal measure. It could just be like a not a neutral event of like, um, but somehow OCD's latched onto it and said, what if in fact uh, the thing that happened was actually darker than it was? Or, you know what I mean? Like in the context mm-hmm. and at the time, it was perfectly normal, which is why you maybe haven't, second guessed it for like a decade and then suddenly it's popped into your head of what if it was if that makes sense like Mm -hmm. I think I understand your question and I I, to me the answer is both because I think Mm -hmm. it's kind of like what do we call real event OCD and I think it can encompass the both things um so I've had clients that call me about oh call me about something that like probably everybody would sort of feel yeah um, uh, not proud over that they, um, that they wish they didn't do, you know, so it's not mm-hmm. like they, people feel good about it. Um, and then somebody's OCD can of course get attached to that. Um, it, but then I've also had people that call and they have this sort of event that, um, that does seem somewhat neutral <laughs> and, um, and most people kind of wouldn't even like bat an eyelid at that. And then mm-hmm. other people, uh, people with OCD, their minds, get stuck on that event. And like you said, it could be um, with either case though, it could be something that, um, I, I found this to be common and I did put this in my article that one of the hallmarks of this, I think, are like that you kind of did let it go at first, you know, that like for at least for a year or two or sometimes 10 years, the person hasn't, um, Mm -hmm didn't it didn't like maybe they didn't like it but it didn't really stick with them and then all of a sudden it's kind of coming back up um out of the woodwork and it all and it's feeling like a daily issue and Mm -hmm. uh, you know it's sticking with them all the time versus um you know like for and it's like well how about how did I for the past 10 years not care about this and then all of a sudden now this is feeling like the most important thing in my life that I have to solve before I can like actually move on to live a happy life yeah yeah that definitely sums up my experience <laughs> yeah 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 this, uh, sorry go on. and people and people it's 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 interesting when they um when they email me where they call me or they sit down in front of me for the first time hmm. and they're kind of saying about to like reveal this thing. And I'm going like, I'm a little bit like, what is this going to be? You know? Yeah. <laughs> and, um, I've never, um, you know, there's never been a time that I was kind of like, Whoa, this is bad. You know? Yeah. Um, it's always just kind of like, well, these poor people, you know, these poor people are really suffering and, um, And, um, they're so afraid to tell me this, (laughs) Mm. you know, and they're afraid I'm going to turn them in and call the police or that I'm going to say like, this is an OCD and and you have a major problem. So it's, it's a, it's one of the scariest things I think for the sufferer, one of the scariest themes it can be. Yeah, no, it makes, it makes sense. And, uh, you have, you've, you've asked, you've, sorry, you answered my next question, um, <laughs> but, but I'll, I'll ask it anyway, because I think it's worth reiterating, which is, um, I've kind of wrote the question as why is this still OCD? But I guess a, a question, a question a listener might have is, but how is this OCD when something actually happened or I did something that now I'm worried that it was bad or maybe it wasn't quite right or, um, yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that is a little a little different question. Um, mm. But the reason why is because of how it's not the event that's the problem. It's actually how your brain's reaction to the event that's the problem. Mm. So, yes, something did happen. And something did happen that you're ashamed of and that you're not proud of. And, and most of the people that I talk to, it's they don't want to ever repeat that event, yeah. <laughs> you know, and they won't ever repeat that event. Um, it's actually actually ego dystonic, which isn't in line with their values and who they want to be as people. Um, sometimes we do things that, are, you know, we aren't. Mm -hmm. happy that we did, you know, and, um, or, you know, like you said, on the other side, even something that is so mild, um, that your OCD is telling you is terrible, but it's really mild to most people. Um, and, um, the reason why it's OCD is that your brain isn't moving on from it. Um, it's resurfaced it. It's using it actually to get you to feed it. So because OCD, the food for OCD is compulsions. Mm. And so it's actually like using that to make you feel ashamed, guilty, terrible, potentially a terrible person. And that you're in between a rock and a hard place. You're feeling like I need to, um, solve this uncertainty um, to be able to move on and live a happy life and to feel that I'm a good person. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of defending your own self-esteem and self-worth by doing the compulsion. Um, and so the reason why it's different from OCD is that it's, it's resurfaced. It won't leave your, your head. Whereas for somebody with OCD, your brain would be able to let it go. Maybe it would come up occasionally, um, and you wouldn't feel good about it, mm -hmm. but then your brain would be able to let it go and you'd be able to maybe like continue on with work and family events and, and, um, and you might occasionally think about it, but it's just not so sticky. And then also that person then to be, to try to stop the assault on their brain, they are performing compulsions. Um, and so that's what makes it OCD, the, not the event itself <laughs> or not the catalyst of all of this, but actually the, the, um, obsessions and compulsions that are associated with it. Yeah. No, thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, yeah, so this question, I guess, would be hard to uh, or ask it, but it's going to be hard to answer, I think, without giving reassurance, which is um, how can someone know if this is OCD or, in fact, a reasonable response to a real event? And actually, now that I'm reading it, you've basically just answered it, but I'll, I'll let you answer just in mm. case there's anything else. Well, I always tell people like you kind of don't get to know mm -hmm. <laughs> um, because and that's sort of like the crux of OCD treatment is to actually sit with that uncertainty um, and not try to answer is this is this OCD or is this something that is a real problem that I need to attend to? And um, if you're sitting there trying to answer that question, you're probably doing a mental compulsion um, that's going to fuel this and make it worse. So um, I would rather redirect people to focusing on the person they want to be and being that person and like going and living their life now and not spending a lot of time trying to answer that question. Um, that's just sort of a trap question, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, and you will like the, I guess like tip offs are, are you, thinking about this every day, all day long and trying to get to the bottom of it. Is there a sense of urgency <laughs> to answer some question? If the answer is yes to those, um, I would just, and maybe if you have other forms of OCD or you have in the past, just kind of like, let's chalk this up to OCD and decide to kind of live in the moment and try not to figure it out, mm -hmm. including trying not to answer if it's OCD or not. Yeah. 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 Good. Good. I like that. Um, and we're gonna, gonna, I'm going to get, um, uh, a couple of questions I made, which kind of hopefully unpack it in a bit more detail in terms of what it actually looks like. Um, mm -hmm. And then the treatment. But I guess before that, um, I don't have a question on this, but something that I, I think would be, I'll say a couple of things. And then if, if you can uh, explore it from the therapy side is, uh, I guess I'm thinking about this from, say, relationship OCD point of view is um sometimes people with relationship OCD will see a relationship as very black and white of kind of the almost the Disney type relationship of it's perfect and it's 
there can't be anything wrong, anything for need and improvement. And if there is, that may mean it's not the right relationship, X, Y, and Z. Uh, when in reality, we know relationships can be messy sometimes and they can need work and even a great relationship, uh, you need to work together to to make it a good relationship. Um, or at least I've found that in my own life. And sure. w- whereas with, and again, with real event, it's kind of, I do one thing slightly wrong in my past I could latch onto that of I'm a terrible person whereas in reality as humans we all make mistakes and we all do things that may not even be considered mistakes but just aren't completely congruent with who we are even if it's now it may have been at the time um, or may not have been Uh, so I guess what I'm getting at is kind of just the 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 OCD view of things can be quite black and white, and and I can see why that's real event OCD can become a problem, instead of realizing that we're humans and we make mistakes. Absolutely, um, the you're calling that out perfectly. The cognitive distortion mm. of all or nothing thinking is absolutely present in this one because you're believing that um, there's only two boxes you could fall into, which is sort of like I you know, didn't make this mistake and I'm a good person Mm -hmm. (laughs) or I did this one thing and that puts me in the other box is like an evil, terrible, depraved human being that isn't redeemable even. And, um, Mm -hmm. and so that's not really how real life is. And life is a continuum. And the um, relationship OC is actually a very good example that I try to use with clients so that they can kind of understand um, when I'm treating this um, that there is middle ground and that we, you know, sometimes I'll do a draw a line with a continuum to have them kind of put themselves uh, on the continuum instead of in this, these black or white boxes. But mm-hmm. um, to say like, well, how close are you to kind of being a good person on this continuum based on what you did, you know, would you be in the same category as like murderers and rapists and um, child monsters? Uh, would you be closer to that, you know, side of the continuum? Um, or Mother so, Teresa uh, or Jesus. Right, or exactly, exactly. So yeah. we might not be that far over, but um, but we yeah. are probably closer to that side, um, even though the, based on sort of the offense, um, and really it's not the, quote unquote offense itself, but really your brain's reaction to that. And that, you know, if you really think about it, you're, pre- I bet you that you're not the only person that's done this thing that you're, you know, worried about doing. So, yeah, no. Yeah. Thank you for that. And you actually, you, um, again, in the, uh, the link I'll put to your article, you've put that sort of, uh, not timeline. What did you call it? Uh, was continuum. It continuum. Mm-hmm. Sorry. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's quite funny i thought that was a good a good visualization um okay so and you have mentioned this but i guess it would go good to go in a bit more detail of what some of the obsessions and some of the compulsions look like for this theme sure um the uh i've had I'm trying to think if i can give you some well i i would say the most common type of person (laughs) client that comes to me with the most common theme that they talk about is usually something they did as a child, some childhood sexual play, Mm -hmm. playing doctor. (laughs) Um, There's always some factor that they're, that they're adding to the mix or that their OCD is inserting that makes them potentially like the, bad person right like it could be well I was older than the person or mm. you know um I was a boy she was a girl type of thing. right yeah. yes exactly there's always some mm. kind of special unique unique circumstance um and um so that would be a very common you know the compulsion would be or I'm sorry the obsession would be what if I'm a bad person? What if I was like too old for that to be happening? What if that um, makes me um, a child molester today? You know, sometimes that can even be incorporated with a POCD, um, somebody that has pedophile OCD. Um, And then, um, so I would say that that's far and wide (laughs) the most common experience that people are kind of looking back at with regret. Um, And I I tell them, I'm like, everybody (laughs) could probably tell a story about that, Mm -hmm. you know, but how many people's brains are thinking about it every day, 
you know, when they're 30 years old or, you know, um, when this is something that happened under age of 10. Um, and so, so that would be the, um, a type of compulsion It's usually like, and then OCD in terms of the obsession could also insert things like, um, what if you weren't under 10? What if you were actually 15? What if you were 18? You know, um, I've had clients where their OCD is telling them that they might have been an adult, you know, when that happened. And so now they're really, um, really, really spiked. So it's kind of OCD has its way of kind of like making you doubt even what really happened. Like, what if you did more? Another com- um, obsession could be what if you did more than just looked at each other's genitals? What if you, you know, d- you know, what if, and then it kind of might add some, some extra stuff. And then the person's not uncertain then about what their memory even is about yeah. the event. So those are just different. Um, and it could be a wide range though of things, you know, um, I've had clients that just kind of had, you know, babysitting type things. Um, I've had clients that have had, like, I didn't treat my dog well. I bullied someone. I, you know, and, and now their brain won't, uh, is, you know, won't stop thinking about it. Um, the compulsion, um, the common compulsions with this, um, The mental compulsions are very common. Usually mental review is the most common, I would say, mental compulsion, which would be going back over the event and trying to reconstruct the event in your mind and trying to um, um, determine, was am I a bad person? How bad was this? What age was I? (laughs) What, you know... Mm -hmm. um, what would other people think about me if I did this? So there's a lot of analysis that could kind of go on there. Um, Other forms of compulsions could be avoidance. Like people might avoid the subject of their real event. um, If that, if that person would bring back those thoughts and memories, Mm -hmm. Um, there's also some sort of, you know, sometimes some checking behavior. Like I've had people that they're really afraid that the subject of their real event, if there is another person involved, not all the time, that there's not always, but they might actually be like checking their profile on Facebook to see like, are they okay? Do they seem depressed? Are, are they doing drugs? Like, do mm. they have, you know, are I don't know. Are they still like, friends do... with me on Facebook and that type of stuff? Yeah. I mean, right. I mean, if the person's like not connected with them even anymore in life, just kind of like, are they, have they killed themselves? Like, are they, you know, have they turned to a life of drugs, you Mm -hmm. know, because of me? Um, cause that's usually like, again, something that OCD would be telling you is that you've ruined somebody's life. Um, and so, or potentially, um, and, um, another maybe compulsion could be, um, to, um, I'm trying to think of the other one I was thinking. Oh, like reassurance. Like if somebody is brave enough to tell a loved one about the event, which I would say some people, some people are like so ashamed they haven't told a soul. Mm -hmm. And then some people have, you know, kind of opened it up to family members. And then, then if, if that has happened, they might kind of like incessantly talk to the family members about, do you think it was bad? you know, have you ever done anything like Mm -hmm. this? What would other people think if they knew? Um, Is this going to ruin my career if I become a writer or actor, you know? And so um, people are really afraid about it ruining their life um, too. So they might ask for a lot of reassurance. Um, And as we know that the, even though you might feel temporarily better and the family member is more than willing to kind of um, give them reassurance because they don't believe that this person should be like punishing themselves for life about these issues. Uh, they, um, you know, we know that this is actually making the OCD worse and making them mm. more stuck. So, yeah, no, thank you. That was a really good list. Um, and yeah, with the, the compulsion mental reviewing of kind of going over and over again in your head, the memory of what did or didn't happen and, uh, mm-hmm. The, the, yeah, as as we know, the issue with that, as with I guess with any compulsion, is the more you do it, the, the less certain you become, and, and it becomes grayer and grayer and grayer to the point that you don't even know what the original worry was—not the original worry, but the original memory was—because it's got all these new layers. Because 
the more you seek that certainty, the less of it you've had, you've had. Absolutely. Uh, that's a very good point. I had, um, as a strange side example, I had one time lost my keys and I thought, where are my keys? I was like needing to go somewhere and I was really um, trying to remember where I put them. And my mind actually created a memory of like them falling back behind my dresser because I was like needing to know the answer so badly where they were. And, um, it's, they weren't behind my dresser, but, you know, our minds sort of reconstruct, you know, things, um, and add, like you said, add layers of, um, untruth even to the thing. So, um, when people do try to do this mental review and reconstruct the event, um, they oftentimes will then remember things that didn't actually happen. And if they're doing this for multiple years before they come into therapy, half the time they can't even really tell me what the real story is Mm -hmm. because they have sort of forgotten what's true. They think they know, of course. Um, but then they've added, you know, their OCD, of course, has added so many more, you know, with, with all of the review, um, of it. I've even had clients physically act out like, okay, I, you know, I, this is what happened here. Like the child was laying here. I changed the diaper, you know, and they're actually kind of like physically sort of acting out the, um, thing again, the event again and again, um, in, in effort to kind of make sense of it in their head. Um, which again, it just confuses you even more. Yeah. No, yeah. A really, really good point. Um, yeah. And I think, uh, yeah, I hesitate to speak about my own experience, but maybe just I will because I think it will, will bring something to it. But if I, uh, yeah, when I would used to mental review and I would get to a point with, oh, actually, no, that, that, that part of it couldn't have happened because, uh, and I would find some relief because uh, I've kind of figured it out in my head. And then a minute later, a thought would pop in, but what about this? And it would think about some other element or some other way of looking at what happened from a different unethical evil angle and then it would start the cycle over again even if i felt relief initially my brain would find a way to throw it back in my face absolutely that's a very um that's a very good point to make for for people because when that happens like ocd that's why compulsions really don't work Mm. because ocd will you know as soon as you find any bit of relief um ocd will just need to find a way to to say, but Hey, wait, how about this? You didn't look at it like this or, you know, after they leave my office, sometimes it's like, but you didn't explain this to her. Like you didn't say that, like, you know, (laughs) um, that you also did a, B or C, you know? And, um, and then that's kind of like this, you know, that happens when you're doing mental review. It also happens when you're doing reassurance seeking, you know, when people go to doctors to find out if they have this terrible illness, you know, they're like, but I forgot to tell the doctor about this symptom, you know? So it's, um, OCD will absolutely just try to insert another doubt in your head about, you know, another aspect of it. Absolutely. And did do you get anyone come in the next week or have you and said, oh, I've, I forgot to tell you this aspect or I didn't and almost confessing? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Like, I don't think I've told you everything, you know, mm. and people it's interesting because people sort of do hold back a little bit on this because they're so ashamed and shameful that there probably is part of it that they haven't told me. But I kind of don't care. I'm like, I don't need to know. Mm. I could tell who the person is that moment they sit down in front of me (laughs) and I could tell that they're terrified and I could tell that they're remorseful and I could tell that they're terrorized and I just know that it's OCD I don't need to know all the details like Mm. clients don't know that we don't need to know everything um to know what to do and um yeah yeah Yeah, I think that's a really a really good point um of distinction Okay, so the so next one is, what, what does ERP look like for this theme? How would you work with it? Especially as the compulsions are mental primarily. Right. Um, so we, um, imaginal exposure scripting is a very common um, thing that we use for real event OCD. Um, and a lot of times, um, 
you know, I forgot to mention in the, when we were talking about the compulsions, like one of the compulsions would be Mm self-punishment because people believe and are fearful that they've done something terrible and that they don't want to get away with doing something terrible that, um, they're afraid of getting some, maybe I would say, you know, some of the people are afraid of getting away, but some people are afraid of getting, getting punished or going to jail or something like that, or like their career being ruined. And then the other half are maybe afraid of like not being punished. Like I, I might be a terrible person for this and I don't know. Um, I need to know so that I can be properly punished for the, um, offense. And so they will, um, you know, be mean to themselves about it and tell themselves how terrible they are um, in order to sort of feel a sense of relief because if at least if they're punishing themselves, they haven't been left let off the hook about it. Mm. So um, in terms of ERP, sometimes with the ex- imaginal exposure scripts, we I might just have the people write the event itself without any side commentary or judgments, but literally just word for word what happened in the event, because a lot of times that will trigger OCD to say, you know, and this, and how about this when you did this and this makes you terrible, you know? And so we want with exposure work, we want to trigger, you know, really like wake the angry beast of your OCD. And so we, um, you know, we have them write the script exactly how the event happened instead of exaggerating it or saying how terrible the, you are, because that would kind of could be a form of self-punishment that we don't want the, that compulsion added to the script. So um, I usually kind of start with that, um, mm. with having people just write the event itself out. Um, and that's usually pretty triggering because their OCD is going to tell them that they didn't um, they, you also may have done A, B, or C, or, you know, you haven't, you know, covered this completely or, you know, so it sort of like really can, um, trigger the OCD to, um, get spiked, which is exactly what we want with an exposure. Um, we would want to obviously stop them from doing compulsions or, um, you know, any sort of checking or, um, acting out of the scene or anything like that, um, that, they may be doing, um, if they're doing any avoidance of certain TV shows or movies, um, articles, we would have them purposely Mm -hmm. seek out things that would spike their anxiety, um, related to the event. And then also, um, we obviously would do the response prevention part, um, which is, you know, well, as far as the mental rituals, um, we can't always stop thoughts. So because the, those thoughts are mental, really being able to label when you and try to interrupt when you okay. are going down the rabbit hole with the mental review, um, maybe agreeing with it and saying, yeah, who knows, maybe that um, hmm. happened that way or maybe that does make me a bad person. I don't need to figure that out right now. Um, and then really redirecting to the what you were doing in the moment, Mm -hmm. being able to kind of like focus on your valued living, what you care about at that moment, what you, your, you want your life to look like in that moment. Yeah. No, I like that. So yeah, catching, catching yourself in the act of mental reviewing, labeling it of, Oh, I'm, I'm mental reviewing right now. And yet potentially like you said, uh, kind of acknowledge it and then, okay before I was mentally reviewing I was actually writing this email to someone bring my attention back continue writing repeat rinse and repeat mm-hmm. and that you know and you might notice it tries to creep back in five minutes later two yeah. minutes later and that's okay you could just kind of become the observer of what your brain's doing I always say that like OCD can't when if you know it's trying to con you, you know, so the, that awareness that it's trying to kind of like get you to feed it um, and that you're going, oh, I know what you're doing there. You know, I'm not going mm-hmm. to. And even though your OCD is going to say, oh, this is an OCD. Don't be silly. Like this is a real event. Like you, you know, stop lying to yourself that you go, OK, I know that's part of it. I know that's part of the con man of OCD, con mm. person, sorry, yeah, trying, to get, <laughs> trying to get me to, um, yeah. you know, feed it with compulsions. Yeah. yeah. No, thank you for that. Um, uh, and the next question is, and I always ask this whenever I do a theme specific episode, um, which is just <laughs> that it, is ERP as effective for real event OCD as it is for other themes? 
Sure. Yeah. I think um, people can get a lot better um, with any form of OCD. Like I kind of don't want to make this form special. Mm. I think people do kind of feel like their form is special and especially untreatable or, you know, especially um, terrible. Um, But let's try to think of this that let if we can try to think of the theme doesn't matter and it's really just your brain's reaction to um what is you know your brain trying to use what you value and what you care about to um you know so that it you will feed it and make it more powerful and let's try to get out of the theme and if you stop kind of indulging your OCD, you can get better and you have to be really, really super extra, extra brave, I think for this one, Mm -hmm. um, because you do feel, you know, it is sometimes based on something that you feel very ashamed about and you wish you didn't have, didn't happen. Um, but I think trying to remind yourself that you, um, you know, this is, you get to be the person you are and want to be and that this is just your brain glitching and that you don't have to kind of pay attention to what it's trying to do um you know you're aware of what it's trying to do and it's not different than any other cd theme um and that you can get better if you're if you're brave enough to Mm. um to sit with the uncertainty to sit with the guilt like it this comes with a lot of guilt (laughs) um Mm. not just the anxiety piece but also the guilt piece which can feel intense you know and scary you feel like you've done you're a bad person you've done something wrong and that's hard to sit with sometimes but you know keeps it um I think also kind of connecting with maybe other people in the OC community so that you can listening to this podcast like I always kind of assign people to try to hear other people's stories so that you are brave enough to kind of go the road you know um to go down that road yourself and um um sit with some of that discomfort yeah, no, well, thank you for getting people to listen to it. Uh, and I, I, think that's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's good. I've never thought about it from from listening to different people's stories, whether that's hearing their stories on the podcast or hearing them in a support group or wherever. Um, yeah, I think I, I predict, and definitely from my own experience, but I predict that if you listen to many people's their stories and their different themes, you'll, you'll hear different, yeah, d- different themes being talked about, different life stories. But I, I predict you'll see a pattern of, hang on a minute, this is all the same thing. It's talked about differently, you know, the the monster's different, so to speak. But in reality, it's all the same, I guess the same monster, but just wearing different masks. And I don't, I don't want to call OCD a monster, but, you know, it's, well, I'll stick with that, mm-hmm. that analogy. But it's just Feels wearing like different that. masks. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've, you know, I've, I've run OCD groups for many years and I do think that that has been so helpful in the sense that you do feel like there's a pattern here that's happening. Like our brains kind of work the same. We understand each other, even if the theme is completely different and to not kind of like get tied into what your theme is and feel like this, um, you know, people get so angry having to come and sit on the couch there and talk about like being a pedophile when they're like not a pedophile. Mm. It's like, gosh, it's like, I just, can I just talk about my like regular life in therapy? Do I really have to like talk about, um, you know, these stupid things? And so, um, so I get it. Um, Mm. you know, it's good to kind of think of it as like, this is a real disorder and this is not these, these themes that it kind of like land land upon even if it is like a a life event that happened to you Mm. it's just like the vehicle that OCD is using to trick you and to trap you and and to really kind of like see the context more than the content if possible yeah uh, yeah spot on um and I guess yeah because I hesitate for a long time to do these theme specific episodes because I was like OCD is OCD and we treat the, the the OCD we don't treat the theme um Mm -hmm. and but then I was like I also want to do these because I want people to feel validated and understood within their theme and there are some slight nuances between them that that can be approached and definitely from ERP's point of view it is it is used slightly differently to make sure you're targeting the right part of the OCD um but no that was that was that was brilliant thank you um 
I'll kind of ask a joint question now around, is there anything you want to say on this theme, either around mindfulness or self-compassion? Um, well, mindfulness is definitely an important piece. And, you know, we use acceptance and commitment therapy for OCD uh, treatment. And that is just really being able to say that the thought, because what's happening is when with real event OCD, like the intrusive thoughts and really they're kind of like intrusive thoughts about the memory mm. um, of what happened. And then also obviously all this extra stuff that OCD adds to it. Those are really, the, the event is not happening right now. The event happened 15 years ago, 20 years ago, or last week or whatever. Um, and what you're having is a thought about the event. Um, and the thought is something you can work, you, you work on with mindfulness, which is just being able to let your brain have thoughts and to like notice them and become the watcher of, of your thoughts and, and, um, what's coming in and like, it can be like a cloud floating by mm -hmm. with that sort of memory on it. And you could become the watcher of that. And you are not that thought, you are the being witnessing that thought. So, um, uh, same with the feelings and the guilt, you know, you can kind of become, mm -hmm. let those be there without resistance. We want to have as, as low resistance as possible. And so a lot of times we want to ask ourselves, how willing are we to kind of have that intrusive thought um, or memory? This is good for people even without OCD, um, that whatever intrusive thought or memory um, our feeling is there, how willing are we to sort of experience that and to not view that as a problem, but to view that as, um, a normal part of the human experience and, um, mm -hmm. and that our resistance will actually make it more powerful and more impactful. And so the more you really work on that, the less power it will have over you, um, the less likely you'll need to do compulsions because you're going to build that muscle for feeling that discomfort and mm -hmm. not needing to get rid of that, not needing to eliminate it and really being able to peacefully coexist with whatever shows up in your brain. And, um, um, and then that softens that, um, connection to it. So you, sorry, you mentioned mindfulness and what was the oh, other uh, self-compassion? Oh yes. <laughs> self-compassion. I think like self-compassion is a, such an important piece with real event OCD specifically because this thing did happen or you did do this thing. And so I think being able to kind of be kind to yourself about it, realizing you're not alone. Mm -hmm. Um, and in the suffering, um, there's many millions of people with OCD that know where you're coming from and that, um, the self-compassion piece is extremely important. The, um, the self-forgiveness, like sometimes people have been encouraged to like, you have to forgive yourself to kind of make this thing go away. Mm. Um, like to me, like sometimes I feel like that could become a compulsion or be a compulsion if people really start to focus on, um, yeah. I need to, um, somehow talk this out in therapy about the event, which would just kind of serve as like a an analysis of the event itself. And sometimes could kind of like then make you feel like this is something that needs forgiven when everybody else just gets to walk away from doing it. <laughs> um, and, um, and not be punished for it, that kind of thing. Yeah. No, thank so. you. Thank you for explaining that. Uh, so next question is around families. So assuming <laughs> I, I can imagine maybe a fair few people with this theme probably kept it secret because of feelings of shame or guilt. Um, mm -hmm. But let's say the families are aware. Uh, how, how can families help their loved ones deal with this theme? Well, I have noticed that families like often, you know, find it very hard to see their families, family members suffering so badly, feeling so guilty, feeling so bad about themselves. Um, some people do, are suffering so badly, even though they're so ashamed of it, they're suffering so badly that they pick maybe their mom or somebody they feel closest to, to find, to share it with maybe their, um, you know, spouse or something. And that person like, of course does not see them in that way at all. And so they want to kind of tell that person and give them reassurance and, you know, tell them that that's not something they have to worry about or that they have engaged in those types of activities before or that they, you know, um, you know, that, that they're not a bad person, you know. So I think maybe as a 
you know, as a one time, just kind of, you know, I might tell clients just as a one time reassurance, you mm-hmm. know, that like, I don't see you that way. And, but this is the only time I'm going to tell you this, mm-hmm. um, um, you know, and, but we want to kind of like maybe talk to family members about not kind of giving repeat repeated reassurance about the event itself, even though it's so tempting. And even though that person continues to come to you desperate for that information, um, sometimes we can teach family how to kind of like, you know, be on the same side as, um, as their family member against the OCD and, you know, really being able to kind of like label when, um, when, when they can kind of, become a warrior and sit with discomfort or maybe sit with guilt um, and practice those mindfulness skills. Um, so maybe they encourage them to do like some of their scripting or something like that rather than giving the reassurance. Um, so, so we would, you know, sometimes if, if there's a supportive family member that has been giving a lot of reassurance, trying to kind of teach them other skills to help that person in that moment. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, and then just uh, words of hope for people with this theme or OCD in general. Well, I feel like it does get better. There's a lot of hope. The treatment works, you know, and, um, you know, get yourself to a OCD specialist and somebody that's seen a lot of cases so that you can, um, you know, get get going and start winning against your OCD, there is a lot of hope, um, for things to get a lot better and, um, and that free, you know, to really be able to focus on getting back to the life you want to live and get it, stop thinking about this thing that happened in the past. You really can kind of like today, you know, Mm -hmm. you don't even have to wait to, you know, feel better. You could actually start living today, the life you want to live and being the person you want to be. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then uh, you can pick up the phone and call your 20-year-old self. What would you tell her? <laughs> um, oh, my gosh. Okay. Um, I would probably, I would say at that point I hadn't yet maybe learned enough about mindfulness myself and, you know, had some anxiety myself. And I think I would tell her um it's okay to feel uncomfortable and that you don't have to solve it and you can sit with discomfort and the less you sort of fight against that discomfort, the more you will, um, you know, the stronger you will be Mm. and the less impactful it will be for you. So, um, I remember kind of learn, you know, probably in my early twenties learning about mindfulness and how kind of life-saving that was. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing. Um, and, uh, you've got a billboard. What do you want written on that billboard for everyone to see? Um, I feel like this is the actor studio question. Yeah. <laughs> um, Similar. Let's see. <laughs> um, let me think. Um, I would say maybe similar to what I said earlier. Um, I'm not my thoughts. I'm the being who witnesses my thoughts. Mm. Nice. I like that. Um, and I guess lastly, is there anything else that, um, you wish I would have, uh, you wish I would have asked you today? Hmm. I don't think so. Hmm. I think, ju- I think we covered everything. Um, just kind of want to, you know, I know there's a lot of people suffering with this one out there and I just kind of want to say that, um, you know, hang in there, even though it was a real event, you still can, um, you know, this is not different than other, um, themes, you know, your brain is just telling you that this is important and it's trying to get you to do compulsion. So do your best to kind of like pull back and try to not pay attention to the, to the theme and what it's trying to tell you what the OCD is trying to tell you. And instead, you know, let's get busy on today, doing what you want to do today. Mm. Um, figuring out what that is. Actually, we can't do much today because of the coronavirus. Yeah, well, right? yeah. We have to do something at home, <laughs> find something to do at home, pick a hobby, pick a craft and kind mm. of really try to focus on that at home. 
Cool. So. No, thank you. Uh, I really appreciate your time today, and uh, I've learned a lot on this topic. Um, yeah, so it's great, great to hear it, and I'm, I'm confident it's going to help a lot of people. That's great. Wonderful. Thank you for having me. So there you have it. Thank you so much for listening and thank you to Stacey for her time and talking about this particular topic. And quick disclaimer, guys, this podcast is not therapy. It is not a replacement for therapy. Please seek treatment from a trained professional. Until we speak, take care. Thank you.